<laughs> so welcome everyone uh most of you were here a couple of weeks ago on the business planning and finance one i think kate's kate and tony possibly weren't um so i thought we've got uh, gareth and ed again doing running the session ed is um busy growing and said he might be a few minutes late so i think he's going to join us shortly um I have to go at half past, so I'm going to leave you in Gareth and Ed's capable hands. In terms of format, we'll do a pretty similar format to what we did last week, uh, two weeks ago. So there'll be about an hour of Gareth and Ed presenting and then about an hour for you all to ask questions. Um, but yeah, do put questions in the chat um, as they occur to you in the first half. And then Gareth can look at the chat um, and Ed can look at the chat and answer some of those questions as we go down. Um, and yeah, I thought it'd just be nice to do a quick check-in. So um, if everyone could, I'll, I'll do my check-in and then I'll pass to someone. And if you do like a 30 second check-in and then pass to whoever you'd like to pass to and we'll just try and make sure we've gone round everyone. So um, yeah, I am. Um, I'm good. I'm mostly thinking about the weather this weekend because it's my daughter's birthday and we've got a bouncy castle and I want it to be sunny for her. <laughs> and I'm going to pass to Jennifer. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, always, anyway, I'm normally, I'm, just, I'm Jenny normally, always think it says Jennifer. But anyway, it's fine. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, from Leeds, from me, Kurtz for Valley Farm. And um, yeah, looking forward to doing this first one I've done as a group, so I've missed the other so far. So yeah, looking forward to that. Um, who shall I pass to? Kate, who's outside by looks of it. Mind you, I don't know. Kate here. Uh, I think yeah. Hi, I think I've just hi. managed to unmute myself. Sorry, I am making the most of the weather down here in Sussex, <laughs> so I'm weeding as we uh, <laughs> to listen as well. Um, so uh, I'm Kate. I was here at the last um, meeting, which was great, and um, we I, I set up a, a community garden slash therapeutic horticulture project um, over the last 15 years, which is a CIC. But we have been blessed to be able to have access to now a sort of 18 acre farm slash mini farm which we are setting up, we have set up as a market garden, still setting up and uh, want to become a CSA. So brilliantly happy to have this mentoring. And uh, yeah, I'm happy. I'm in the sun and I'm outside. It's all good. <laughs> I, I can't actually see everyone because I'm on my phone. So um, uh, hang on, who can I see? Uh, I can see Lisa. Can we pass to Lisa? Hey, I'm Lisa. I'm in Edinburgh. Um, I'm part of a group that's putting has been spending a couple of years trying to persuade Edinburgh Council to give us 100 acres of land and this I guess is a check-in where we're this is our week of suspense because the committee meetings this week and we're supposed to hear it here at the end of the week so yeah we're just in a bit of a limbo phase waiting getting everything ready but at the same time waiting for news on the lease and news on funding. Uh, the next person next to me is Will Potts. Hi everyone, um, my name is Will, uh, Will Potts, um, and uh, I've got um, an acre here. It's my first year uh, growing on a kind of commercial scale, so um, I'm uh, uh, lots of potential and loads of learning. Um, and I'll pass on to Tony. Hi, I'm Tony, um, from Edinburgh, part of the same group as Lisa, the Edinburgh Agriculture Co-op. So Lisa just give a little rundown of where we're at at Lauriston Farm. Um, and I'm currently not feeling very well, so I'll join the session for as long as I can. But it's just the spring flu. <laughs> I feel like I have to say, <laughs> say that because now everybody looks at you like that. Oh. Um, anyway. Yeah, very, and um, looking at Kate and enjoying the blue sky. Um, but I will pass on to um, Jessie. Hi, I'm Jessie from Oakbrook Orchard. Um, I'm feeling a bit sad that I'm sitting inside the office today and not in the blue skies. <laughs> um, but out on the orchard, um, I've been really enjoying trying to get to grips with scything. 
I will pass to Rachel and Chloe. Hello. Um, yeah, we saw some of you the other week and some people seem new. It's great to see so many people all in the same tribe. Um, we are at Wakelands, just setting up um, a no dig. And um, you know, learning very fast. <laughs> <laughs> Making loads Learning of mistakes. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think this is, you know, part of the course. Um, you want to say anything? Um, uh, just, yeah, steep learning curve. And um, uh, we are going to beat Cooch Grass. That is our mission. <laughs> We're going to report back next year to tell you all how successful we've been. <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll pass to um, Leanne and Adam. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. Hi. Hiya, <laughs> Hiya. Um, Leanne and Adam. We're just setting up uh, a small C uh, CSA veg, community veg garden in West Somerset on the edge of Exmoor. Uh, first year, feeling a little bit overwhelmed, feeling like we're learning a lot very quickly yeah. as well. But it's all good. Um, starting as well. All good and exciting. <laughs> so we'll hand over to who hasn't been? Uh, Matthew. Hello there. Uh, yeah, Matthew. Uh, little market garden in Suffolk. Um, yeah. So the biggest thing I'm sort of working on at the moment is uh, I had a great meeting with um, with Dan from um, School Farm. Uh, by setting up the way he does his CSA um, and I love this idea of drop-off points so I've been telling all my customers that we're, we're changing and we're going to do drop-off points um, and now I just have to figure out what a drop-off point is <laughs> uh, <laughs> where it'll work um, <laughs> um, and yeah try and find some so that's 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 the sort of challenge I'm, I'm on this week um, yeah uh, has everyone been um, I'm not sure uh, Sarah, Sarah. Yeah. Holly, I think So should I go? I didn't hear. Okay. So was there a specific question? I missed the first. No, just a quick check-in. How are you doing? Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm so I'm Sarah. I work with Jesse at Oakbrook Orchard, which we're we're we've just in the process of setting up. Um, yeah, I've been I've been a bit out of sort of juggling, <laughs> juggling the, the sort of growing and family stuff at this week. So I'm, I'm feeling a little bit out of the loop with <laughs> with any of what's going on at the moment. To be honest, I'm hoping this will help me refocus a bit today. Um, has anyone else not been yet? I think Rianne and Rianne. Holly haven't. I'll pass to Rianne and Ed, who's just come in as chug food. Rianne. Hi, yes, I'm at Coastal Valley Farm in Leeds with Jenny. Um, yeah, looking forward to this session. Um, feeling pretty good. Uh, a bit behind where I'd hoped to be because it's been so cold and a little bit nervous about sowing all our root crops uh, just because they're so, so important for us as, uh, yeah, for, as a year round CSA. Um, but yeah, but working with lots of great people, so that's good. And I'll pass to Holly. Oh, Holly, we can't hear you very well. We might have to leave, Holly. I can't really Hang hear on. you. Can anyone hear me? Not really. No. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Can see you. You can hear me great. Okay. Maybe now. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I'm um, I'm part of Real Veg with Rachel and Chloe. Just out today doing some gardening. Um, really enjoying the learning curve, like the girls spoke to. Uh, feeling very supported by a wider community, especially the LWA local group. Um, Joel and there has been just yeah putting us in touch with some great people. Um, having some really interesting chats with uh, Andy Dibbon and um, yeah some people. Uh, connected with Charles Dowding. So feeling like, as they said, we're on a steep learning curve. We're going right back to letting infrastructure and 
really interested in how everything's going to look in a couple of years' time. I'm really grateful to be here. Thanks for recording also, Susie, because my battery's not going to make it through the session. Okay. Passing to Gareth. Oh, hi, maybe if Heather goes first, then I'll launch into my talk as well, yeah? Let Ed, let Ed say hi to... Oh, and then Ed's like, say hi. Should I wait <coughs> me now or wait for Heather? Heather, yeah, why don't you wait. go first? Yes, well, uh, just an introduction. Is just it? to say hi, yeah, quick check-in. Oh, hi, yes, I'm Growing Local, he I'm Heather, Growing Local, Hereford, um, and uh, yes, just ready to start, get a CSA going once we've got the lands sorted out. <laughs> okay, Ed? Thank you. Uh, hi guys, apologies I'm late. Um, we are literally in the middle of reskinning a 50 metre polytunnel. Um, so it's been a bit of a hectic morning and I'm sure we're going to have a more hectic afternoon. Um, for those of you who I didn't introduce myself to you last week or week four, my name's Ed Hamer, founder and grower at Chag Food Market Garden in Devon. We've been going since 2010. Um, we started on one acre um, back then, uh, doing 25 boxes a week and we're now doing 150 shares on about seven acres. Um, all, all of our shares go within about a seven mile radius of the farm um, and we deliver to central collection points every Thursday. <clears throat> we um, supply our own produce from June through till March each season and then from April to May uh, we buy in supplement any other stored produce we've got with stuff from South Devon Organic Producers uh, and Shillingford Organics. Um, uh yeah at the risk of taking up too much time i'll leave it there and then i'm sure there'll be plenty of questions towards the end but yeah that's that's my summary great so just before gareth introduces himself and starts i'm i'm going at about just before half past 11 so leaving you in ed and gareth's capable hands please do put questions in the chat during the first half of the session um and ed and gareth if you can have the chat open so you can see the questions because yeah. i won't be doing that bit and Gareth is recording the session. Um, so uh, if anyone wants to watch it, I can send a link to the recording out. Um, you should have all got uh, paperwork from on this session. I sent it out on email yesterday. Um, and also just it was, do use the Google group that we set up. And if anyone's not on it, email me and I can put you on it. So yeah, hope this session is useful and uh, I'm gonna sit in for the next 15 minutes and then disappear. Okay, over to you, Gareth. Hi, I'm Gareth. Um, I, I guess most of you were here last time. Um, I work at Canal Side and Five Acres, so two different CSAs. Um, Canal Side, we, um, a bit like uh, Chag Food, really, we work on 10 acres. Uh, we do about 160 shares. Um, uh, and yeah, most of the people, uh, well, people come to the farm to pick up, so uh, they're local. Uh, and we just do seasonal stuff, so we don't buy anything in. So that's just the basics of it. Um, I'm really going to go on and talk now really about governance and management. And it's really based on my experiences with Five Acre and um, uh, Canal Side. And really, I mean, I, I can't emphasize enough, really. It's the way we've done it, you know, but there are other ways of doing things, of course, you know. But I'd just say from our experience, what, what kind of works with them. Um, governing and managing our CSAs, um, where the emphasis really was on a, on a community approach. Um, uh, I, I guess it says it in the name, really. I'm going to share my screen with you all, because it, it's better if I talk. Um, I find it easier to talk to the a structure. So, so hopefully you can all see it. Um, can you all see that? <laughs> Hello. Yeah, that's yeah. good. You're, you're okay, yeah. Yeah. It's on the downside that I can't see all of you now, but uh, never mind. <laughs> um, so really, I'm going to talk to you a bit about last time we talked about business and finance. Based in on that, this time we're get, we're talking more about the, the structure of the company and how the company uh, to be. Um, I think, from my experience, anyway. Um, the, the governance and management of a company all hinges really on having a clear idea of what you are doing and what you're trying to achieve. And I can't kind of emphasize that enough because it keeps you on, you know, focused basically. Um, 
obviously there are a lot of different CSAs with different visions and objectives. Um, but for me, the heart of it all really is about sharing the risks and rewards and farming with the community, which is kind of the strap line for the CSA network. Um, so whatever business plan you have or whatever objectives you have, it would be good. You know, I, I feel that you ought to be embedding that, that kind of approach uh, into your farm, basically in farming. Um, personally, I like to keep things clear and simple. Um, with a vision or a mission or, or however you want to call it, which is clear and simple. Um, and at both CSAs that I work with, I, I mean, our basic vision is growing local seasonal and organic veg and fruit for our members and ensuring that they get a fair share of that produce, basically. So, so it is a shared community business approach. Um, you know, secondary objectives that we have are around educating the community about farming and providing access to seasonal activities on the land. And I mean, personally think that, you know, those are fairly simple objectives and, and, and things that people can readily understand. So, so um, to me, the core of it is being clear and having some fairly simple and clear objectives that you can explain to everybody basically, and obviously that helps you sell your story as well with the CSA. Um, the company structure, well, Canal Side is, as it happens, a community benefit society, which is a type of community co-op. Um, uh, uh, Five Acre is a community interest company. Um, when we started at Canal Side, we were a not-for-profit limited by guarantee. So, personally believe that the important point is don't let the company structure become an impediment to starting up. I mean, if you're, if you're in doubt, just go for a simple not-for-profit model for your business. Um, uh, and don't spend, you know, endless hours discussing what company structure you need. Just the cheapest and easiest company structure is a not-for-profit company, basically limited by guarantee. Um, accountants all understand it. The filing and everything with company's house is easy. Um, it's clear what your legal responsibilities are as directors, basically. You know, most companies in Britain are some form of, of, um, um, of company uh, managed by company house. So um, the only one downside to that is that if you're going to be fundraising, sometimes people prefer you to be a charity or something like that. But I would, I, you know, I would. Um, basically, being a charity is a step up in terms of being accountable to the Charity Commission and filing your annual accounts and all the rest of it. Um, so uh, I personally believe it's better from the outset to, to set off with the idea that you're going to make a, a financially sustainable business, basically, and, and take that approach. Um, so I'm not really going to go a lot into company structures just to say, don't let it stop you getting on with it, basically. Just pick a simple model uh, and go with it. Um, how we've governed our, our CSAs over the years um, is we have basically, in, all the, in both companies, come down to um, the companies are, in a sense, governed by a steering committee or uh, a board um, of, of um, directors. Um, and really, those directors are bound, obviously, by the legal duties of what it means to run a company in Britain and company law, but um, also by the articles of the company, the rules of the society, um, so the rules that you set up with in the first place. Um, in both cases, we've, we've aimed to have a board or a steering committee composed of five to ten members um, at any one time, and on that board, we try and incorporate the growers, um, any other staff, the admin staff, and also members of the of the of the CSA, basically. So people who take a, who take the veg, maybe people who volunteer, or any other people who who've got a legitimate, um, you know, say in how we run the CSA. Basically, we try and include them on the steering committee um, or the board. Um, inevitably, the board ends up taking some kind of what I would call management decisions and I'll talk a bit about that later but I would I found it's best over the years to try and separate out your management from your strategic functions um, 
and I'll and I'll really talk a bit, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, really. Um, but I think suffice to say, for me, it's really important to have an idea how the decisions taken by your board, how the strategy they set or the policy they set, are translated into what you actually do as a company, what the growers do, what volunteers have volunteers are engaged and all the rest of it. And often, in my experience, the real disjunct in sort of small organizations comes when the when the when the board is kind of making decisions which the which people can't actually implement and then it all becomes a bit messy basically um, in canal side one way that we've had of dealing with this is that we have terms of reference for canal for this for the for the board and terms of reference for the staff group which are two different groups which i'll talk through in a bit um, and i think um Susie sent those round, haven't you? Or you, people have got access to them basically if you want to look at them. Um, I think the key, the key for me, the key message really is for the for the board to prepare a concise and realistic business plan, basically, that everyone can understand, be they members, other board members, volunteers. So everybody basically understands what you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to do. Um, and that kind of helps keep you focused um, um, on, 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 well, basically producing good veg, basically. Um, you know, I think we talked around business planning before, so I'm not going to go to town on this, but I mean, you know, it contains some elements of the e ethics and the ethos and the aims of the company. Um, what investment might be needed to, to help it um, uh, get on with things, your, what income you're expecting, what expenditure you're expecting, and, and allied to that, some sort of cash flow. Um, and really, that is for the board to use to monitor that things are going okay, basically. Um, as an aside, there should be some sort of higher level risk assessment in the business plan. And that is, has in fact been a legal requirement on boards um, for a number of years now is that you have to, and by that, I mean, it is the strategic assessment. So, you know, what, what might cause your company to fail basically, um, because the basic law around all this is it's illegal to carry on trading if you're bankrupt basically. And that is a duty that the directors have to ensure that they're not bankrupt basically when they're trading. So um, the other thing about a business plan is it's a dynamic document. You know, once you've written it, it's not set in stone and you have to follow every, um, everything. It's just, it's, it's a guide and you're going to change it basically as you go along. Uh, circumstances are going to change. The business is going to develop, you know. Um, at Canal Side and Five Acre, we kind of update, we have an away day every three to five years and update it basically and make sure that it's current and working for us. Um, the other key task of, of, um, of, of a steering group is to ensure that adequate policies are in place. So it's a legal duty of the directors of the company to ensure that things like there's a health and safety policy in place. Um, you might want things like if you've got a lot of volunteers coming on the farm, safeguarding policies and things like that. So, so um, you know, some policies are like H and E are a legal requirement. Others you might want to add on to to basically so everybody knows um, what your policies are on volunteering, for example. Um, and obviously, once you've outlined your risks and your policies and things, then you can get adequate insurance to cover you for those risks. And for your and for what might go wrong, basically. Um, so, so those are the kinds of key tasks of the, of of a, of a board. Um, how do we run the board? Basically, we have a, a a key way of reporting back. We meet face to face every month. Obviously, that's been a bit sketchy in the last year, but I do believe that a face to face meeting is important. Um, so we can all, um, you know. It allows for a much better interaction, in my opinion. Um, uh, but we have every meeting is kind of structured in a way that we can get through it quite quickly and efficiently. So we have, you know, the grower might be gives a growing report, the finance person gives a finance report on the cash flow, the membership person gives an update on the members, you know, and these are all kind of what we 
might cause dashboard items so we can get to them quite quickly. Um, and um, if you've got a volunteer, you're doing a lot of volunteers, you might have a volunteer management in place who can give an update on volunteers and all the rest of it straight to the board. Um, so then the, the board is in a position really to discuss strategies and policies and things and, and update them or, or adjust them accordingly and make sure that all the things that they need to be in place to legally run the company are in place. And when the time comes, they can, they can um, look at the business plan and adjust it accordingly and alter the strategic aims. So to me, the other really flip side of that is really important to be accountable to the members of your CSA, um, people taking veg or who might have invested or, or what other, if you've got social members, however, whatever, even the volunteers, whoever you've got who have uh, invested in the CSA. Um, uh, our yearly AGMs, we show the accounts in a simple form so everyone can understand them, you know, how much we've spent on seeds, how much we've spent on wages and all the rest of it. Um, we discuss the cost, we discuss what prices we need to have in place to keep our income up and to make a 10% surplus every year. Um, and then we also, of course, talk about what we've grown and, and ask people, um, you know, what it, if they'd like to see anything else. So the main, the other thing is to be accountable to the members in other ways. So we, for example, we do a member survey once a year. Um, Normally all the directors, it's usually at Christmas, so we build a big fire, we stand by the fire, and when people um, come to pick up their veg, we try and talk to every member individually um, about what they think about the CSA, what they'd like to see, what they maybe they haven't liked during the year, and we can adjust things accordingly going forward based on that. Um, the other way we, we're accountable to our members is we have social events and at the social events we do things like run farm walks and discuss what's going on in the farm and we also have a, a newsletter so we're kind of accountable also to our members um, in, in that way. Um, so separating out the board functions so the higher kind of strategic and um, um, things and what the board's responsible for we also um, have staff groups on both farms and, that, and by that I mean the group of people who actively carry out the farm work basically or what's necessary to, to, to run the CSA. So um, in the case of um, both farms at the moment that would be the, any of the growers, um, any admin people, the finance person, um, uh, ideally, a, vol a, a, a volunteer person who's, who's overseeing a, the volunteering effort. And, and, um, so the staff group meets regularly once or twice a month. Um, once again, face to face is best if you can manage it. Um, you know, there's an awful, awful lot of room if you're just swapping emails for, for lots of misunderstanding, basically. Email must be the worst form of communication ever invented. Um, uh, so it's really important, in my opinion, to get that face-to-face -face time with the, with the staff group, basically, so they all, you know, get to know each other and become friends, really. Um, but basically, the key tasks of the staff group, as opposed to the board, are to oversee the, the growing, um, which is clearly the responsibility of the growers. The board employs the growers to grow the veg, basically, um, and they are responsible for making sure we're certified buying all the seed, coming up with the crop rotation plan, you know, all the stuff involved with, with growing, basically. Um, and they're also, obviously, um, the end point of where the volunteers end up is most usually with the growers. So they have to be prepared to, to manage and organize the volunteers at that point. Um, storage, pickup, distribution um, at Canal Side and Five Acre, that is also the responsibility of the growers. Um, as it happens, but it, I think other CSAs have teams that take that on as, as separate groups um, and all that has to be to, to be organized. So um, membership and marketing at both CSAs, we have an admin person who sort of generally oversees our membership and marketing. So any membership questions and things go to the admin person rather than the growers. Um, 
and you know if people want to change their pickup day or whatever the admin person deals with it basically so so there's a separation of duties there um the the admin person also you know does the publicity in a sense that ensures that information is flowing out to the to the members um uh, and keeping everybody in touch with what's happening on the farm um the finance uh, we have a finance person on both farms um and they're basically is running the books so paying the bills making sure the bank's reconciled making sure the members are paying um and that's done on a monthly basis basically and then that's used to feed back to the steering committee so we know exactly how many people are paying how many people are not paying and all the rest of it um more of an aspiration really on both farms is to have a volunteer administration as well so we've got a point of contact for volunteers who who who, who can take up um queries and things with um uh so the growers don't have to deal with the nitty um day-to-day -day, um volunteering um things that come up um in practice it, it kind of gets a bit messy of course because the volunteers tend to get to know the growers better um and so it tends to be sort of shared out across the admin and the, and the growing roles but but i think in both cases we're kind of aspiring to have a separate person to, to deal with all the volunteers who themselves could be a volunteer if you can find that person um, um so i mean in summary really I, I mean that's how kind of we organize ourselves um I think really it's for me it's all based on having with both farms have we have quite a clear idea what we're trying to do and it's all encompassed in the strap line you know seasonal organic veg basically um and we have kind of plans and business plans and things that people can read and understand quite easily um the other thing we spend quite a lot of time as i've already said being accountable to the members understanding their motivations um also as the volunteers and striving to keep them involved. And that, that is going to involve a continual effort, basically, um, uh, every year, all year, basically. Um, obviously, understanding and keeping control of your growing costs is really important. And really being focused on allowing the growers to produce good quality organic veg, basically, because that is the, the central part of your farm, really, uh, in my book. Um, obviously providing a range of social uh, engagement opportunities and events for all your members, volunteers, members of the public, whoever, whoever's interested and depending on your, um, your original vision and mission, you know, if you, if you're educating the public and stuff, then it's going to be your duty to put a lot of this stuff on. So, um, something I always say is understanding the finances is key really and really a kind of unwritten rule we have on both CSAs is we only take grants for capital investment so we don't take running cost grants basically if we can't make it run without grants then it's not in my book sustainable um the other thing is like keeping it light touch and fun you know I mean it's not you know running a business can be fun it's not it's not a complete slog all the time you know what I mean so um and it is quite actually fun to engage with volunteers and members and all the rest of it you know so so I would say don't forget that bit of it as well <laughs> um so well that's what I've said in the last slide so so um that's kind of all I really wanted to run you through really how how we've Kind of approached it over the years and how we've engaged the, our communities in the farm um i don't know is that okay uh i get all right i'm used to taking questions at this point but i guess you've written them all down on the side of you so um maybe the best thing is to um for ed to um talk through his bit and then um, we'll start running down the questions in a more open session afterwards. Is that, is, does that sound good? <clears throat> Great, thanks Gareth, thanks for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, if I just chip in now and then maybe if we do what we did last week, so if we have a five minute break sort of on the hour um, and then we'll come back in for questions and that afterwards. Um, <clears throat> can someone, oh, there it is, share screen. Sorry, it's gonna <laughs> remind me how to share a screen. <clears throat> Uh, oh, is Susie, Susie, are you still on? 
It's saying host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, right. Hang on a minute. Um, oh, is, that you? <laughs> is that you, Gareth, now? I've just made you a host, I think. So you should be able to. OK, try that. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yep. Yeah. Good job. Wait for that to load. Share. OK, can everyone see that? Can everyone see my screen? Great. Yep. Right. Um, great. So we actually, those of you who are in the session two weeks ago, I had this first page, I think, possibly included, but we didn't do it. We skipped over it because we were a bit short time and we spent <clears throat> most of my bit um, going on, uh, through business planning and accounts and finance. Um, so I'm going to go through this. <clears throat> I would just echo a few things that Gareth just said on kind of governance um, and um, structure. Um, one of the first things he said has really rung true for us over the years, which was keep it simple. So try to have a really simple um, mission statement um, and build your business plan around that <clears throat> and keep it in mind because um, as Gareth says, it, it can be a very fun job, but it's an all challenging job um, being a grower year round. Um, and there, there will be times in your first couple of years when you're slogging away in the depths of winter in a muddy wet field, wondering why you're doing it. And I think it's really worthwhile just bearing in mind your mission statement, you know, whether it's to deliver organic local food to your local community um, or to provide voluntary, volunteer opportunities um, or um, educational visits, whatever it might be that you feel passionate about, keep that in mind and, and keep it simple, I'd say. Um, the other thing I want to pick up on was just that disconnect between the board and the growers so we've um we've over the past 10 years we've actually transitioned from a, a community interest company through to a private enterprise <clears throat> and one of the biggest drivers in that was that disconnect between the board and the growers um and um the growers needing a greater sense of agency over the business uh, and what was going on so i think yeah if i was starting out again i might have placed a greater emphasis on that um, from the beginning. Um, <clears throat> the other thing was that the business plan should be a dynamic document. I think that's really key that um, don't just assume that your business plan as you first write it is kind of set in stone um, because you will learn an enormous amount in your first um, year, two years. Uh, and I think it's a really worthwhile process regularly going back and updating your business plan um, based on your own experience um, and learning. Uh, so yeah, that was it. That was the ones I just wanted to pick up from what Gareth was saying. So we're just going to run through my, I think it's four or five pages I've got here. <clears throat> um, uh, really, the first page is just a set of key questions to prompt your form formation process, really. So, so I suppose this is more relevant for those of you who are literally in the first year of your setup. And there are things that really helped with us, um, I found. Um, there are questions that kept coming back for us in our, in our founding year or years. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not going to run through all of them. I'm just going to pick out some of the key ones. But um, it's really good to begin with to have an uh, identify the objective um, and the pr uh, proposed or the key initiators, because you will need a handful of people who are willing to work unpaid or low pay. For, uh, for a period, whether that's a year or a couple of years, to actually get a project like this off the ground. So it, it kind of, um, you will come up against these questions really as to whether where the demand for your CSA is coming from. Is it coming from your local community or is it from a, um, a group of growers or farmers <coughs> who are looking to establish a business? Um, it's really important to highlight at this stage and throughout really that there's no right way of doing it. Um, one, of the, one of the fundamental <coughs> uh, beauties of the CSA model really is that it's a spectrum. Um, and you have um, grower-led CSAs at one end and community-led CSAs at the other. And there's a vast rainbow of um, schemes in between. And it's, it's also probably true to say that, that no two CSAs are identical. I think every CSA that I've ever visited or um, encountered is slightly different, subtly different from another. And it's really important that you <clears throat> adapt your CSA to the strengths and opportunities of both the communities and the individuals involved. Um, that, that are involved in it. So yeah, you could be a farmer looking to expand or diversify, or you could be a group of consumers who have a shared commitment for local food, but, but no farming experience. Either way, you, you're gonna need to identify your objective and those individuals who are gonna do that work to get the project off the ground. Um, an early question really for any CSA is what you're gonna produce, how you're gonna produce it <clears throat> um, and your market. Um, so you might be similar to us on the canal side, looking at doing veg, um, seasonal vegetables. Um, supplied in a, a weekly share, um, or you could 
you could be facing or you could be living or working in a community where there's actually only demand for staple produce, um, you know, potatoes, carrots, onions, um, and people might have their own backyard gardens or allotments for doing the rest of the stuff. <clears throat> there is a great um, example I'll just drop in here from um, in the southeast, um, back along, it's probably 10, 12 years ago, I, I heard about this chap, I didn't go and visit him, but um, it was a farmer in the southeast who was basically growing um, row crops um, on a field kind of in this direction. So he was growing potatoes, carrots, onions, um, and I think he did some brassicas as well. And then he was actually renting out strips this way to different households. So he did all the cultivation and the weeding. And then he rented out the strips of the households. So they had a bit of potatoes, a bit of carrots, a bit of onions, a bit of brassicas. And they, it was up to them then to do the weeding and the harvesting. <clears throat> um, and for me, that was a great example of how far you can take CSA. You know, that was still a CSA, but it was a very low input CSA from the farmer's perspective. Um, but it, it provided just a, 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 a handful of staples for the consumers. Um, another one I'll just highlight is a very good friend of ours in Belgium, um, Tom Trundex at a place called Het Openveld uh, outside Leuven, where he has an entirely self-harvest CSA. So he runs a CSA on similar to us, about seven acres. Um, and he's got about 250 members um, on about seven acres. And <clears throat> the way he manages it basically is he just does all of the growing, but every week he puts a flag out in the field where things need harvesting and writes on the board <clears throat> the weights of the share for the week. And then all of his members, um, without exception, come to the farm uh, and do all of the harvesting themselves. So he hasn't got any harvesting, packaging or delivery costs or um, demands at all. Um, he's just concentrating on growing the veg. So again, it's really worth exploring when you're starting up your CSA, what kind of varieties of models are out there because some might appeal more to you than others. Um, key questions there underneath is, are you aiming to employ a farmer? or maybe you're a community group who um, doesn't want to employ a farmer and wants to um, uh, deliver all of the labor um, yourselves. Um, X to um, community agriculture is a good example of that. Um, or you could be a combination of both. Um, the organic question is also quite um, key early on. Um, <clears throat> are you intended to be um, to produce organic standards? Um, you may not be, and I think it's really important that the CSA model um, encompasses CSAs that aren't organic for whatever reason it might be. Um, obviously, I'm myself, I've been an organic farmer my whole life and I, I couldn't think of growing any other way and you may well be the same. Um, you may feel that it's really important to grow to organic standards, but ultimately it comes down to your consumers really what their preference is. So you could be farming to organic standards, but not certified. So that's kind of us. Um, we, we're not certified through the Soil Association because it's it's not really worth us paying five, six hundred pounds a year for the stamp because all of our members know us personally um, and we have that assurance, we have that guarantee with our consumers. Um, if you are selling a lot of wholesale on the side of your CSA, there may then be a justification to spend that money on the certification to, to give yourself a stamp for, for outside wholesale sales. Um, the other thing is the primary market, are you um, defined by locality or it could be a, for instance, a CSA serving a university campus. Um, so the CSA might be a way out of a town or a city, but you might have a core demand within a university campus in which in which case you'll be tailoring your your supply and your growing um, to that market. Um, and yeah, the, the bottom there one really is, as I was hinting to Tom Thrunbeck's one is, would you like your members to collect their produce from the farm? <clears throat> That's something you probably want to start out with early on. Um, in our experience, we've been pretty restrictive, <laughs> sorry, over the years in terms of um, the offering that we offer with our share in terms of flexibility. Um, one example could be things like potatoes. You know, we've had um, over the past 10 years, increasing numbers of people saying, could we um, opt out of potatoes in the boxes? And it's obviously it's very tempting to say yes, um, you know, we'll bend over backwards to meet your your needs. Um, but actually, the way we deliver our boxes, they go to central collection points and there's no way of telling whose box is whose. Um, and it, it's not practical for us to do individual boxes. So we just had to say from an early point, we just said we'd love to be able to do that, but we can't actually give no potato boxes. So we came up with a compromise, which is basically a swap box where each of our collection points we um, Every week we put in some extra leafy greens um, and the people who don't want potatoes put their potatoes in a swap box and take out the leafy greens <clears throat> and whoever comes along later might want extra potatoes and they can take them. So you, you can be a bit creative about how you manage um, demand and subtleties within the demand as you go. But yeah, my advice, strong advice really would be to, to start being quite restrictive because it's very difficult to go back. If you start from day one offering tailored boxes, individual boxes, <clears throat> then you can't really step back from that in subsequent years. And you can, but you'll probably, you might lose some members or, so I, I would start in an ideal world, start relatively rigid, and then you can always dilute that as you go. 
Um, going on to identifying sites. So I'm going to do a bit on identifying sites and accessing land. So your site is obviously going to be dictated by what you intend to produce. The ideal veg growing site is not necessarily going to be the same as an ideal livestock site. Um, but for veg, key things really are well draining, south facing. I've got the list there, you can read it. So yeah, soils. Um, be wary of things like frost pockets, um, water logging and perennial weeds that aren't always obvious on a first visit to a site. Um, for us, this was a, a classic example. Our first site we took on 2010, <clears throat> it ticks every single box going, um, low lying, sheltered, deep soil, all the rest of it. And it wasn't until our first winter that we got a minus 10 um, and we couldn't get the veg out of the ground, we couldn't dig the carrots out, we couldn't harvest uh, yeah, a lot of the produce. So it, it's often the case that you might, it's worth going to see a site um, at different times a year to get a true indication of what its extremes are. Um, <clears throat> for livestock, obviously you've got to think about sufficient pasture, outbuildings, fencing, those sorts of things. Um, perhaps the key, the key thing in relation to your site is proximity to your primary markets. Um, this isn't, you know, it's not a hard and fast rule, but as a community, I would suggest of um, CSAs, uh, we should really all be um, uh, working towards a goal where we're supplying produce close as possible to the farms and we should be encouraging other CSAs to start up to supply um, other communities nearby. Um, so it, it makes sense really to kind of factor your production site <clears throat> on where you expect to be selling your produce. It kind of goes without saying. Tenancies. Um, so the first line there is kind of something I've come up against throughout the years on our courses, but also through the Land Workers Alliance, um, that there really is a common, <clears throat> I would call it a misconception, that it's nearly impossible for new entrant farmers to access land. Um, this might be biased by the fact that I've grown up in a rural community and I, I am fully aware that, you know, I, when we started Chag Food, we lent a lot on my historic um, residents in the, in the area in terms of accessing land. But even given that, I would say um, it's really important for people, if you're thinking of accessing land, if you're thinking of starting a CSA, just to go and talk to farmers, to knock on doors, um, send letters, if knocking on a door, yeah, you can't really do it in COVID times, send a letter follow it up with a phone call um, and just, yeah, sound out opportunities because you never know unless you ask, basically. Um, you could be <clears throat> pinning your hopes on a, a bit of greenbelt land around the edge of a, a community and um, focusing all of it on there and putting up with quite a lot of compromise without knowing that if you asked a next door farmer or someone a little bit further away, you might have your ideal site. So I would really, in the early stages, kind of exhaust your options. Um, I think we spent with Chagfu, we probably spent at least 12 months um, sounding out different landowners and bits of land um, before we settled for our, our final site. <clears throat> um, so yeah, there's a few tips on there in terms of approaching um, farmers <laughs> in case you need them. Uh, tenancy agreements. Um, so once you've identified a supportive land, you will need a tenancy agreement. Um, uh, just to give you the security, really, if you're investing in a growing enterprise, clearly <clears throat> common sense suggests that the longer your tenancy, the better. If you're investing, certainly if you're investing in anything like soft fruit and top fruit uh, crops that are going to be uh, four to five, even 10 years till cropping, you want some guarantee that that investment in time, energy and resources is going to result in a return for the business. So the way to do that really is with a farm business tenancy agreement. Um, you can find an FBT template online, but more often than not, if you're, you're putting together a, a tenancy with a local landowner, they're likely to want to use your local land agent. So in every, pretty much every town and um, certainly city these days, you'll find estate agents who specialize in land um, and uh, land ties. So you would go to them to pay for them to draw up a mutually agreeable <coughs> FBT. And the cost for that could be in the region of sort of 200 to 400 pounds, depending on uh, what's involved. Um, it is possible to just draw up your own from a template. Um, and we have done that subsequently, but I would suggest in your first instance, you know, in the first years, it might be worthwhile getting a land agent to do that in and factoring that cost in, uh, just in case you miss anything um, essential or obvious. Um, incorporation, we did cover incorporation a bit last time. Um, and I, <clears throat> I was basically yeah, arguing, point. I think actually we covered all of this page and I will summarize for those of you who weren't there, but it was basically to say that, yeah, there's um, two op options essentially for a CSA. One is a community enterprise and one is a private enterprise. And within the community enterprise <clears throat> end of the spectrum, um, there are 
common model in the interest company, um, the, the kick, um, and there's two types of that. There's a large membership CIC, which has more members than directors. Um, it assumes the directors make the day-to-day -day decisions about the business, um, but it gives the members a strong role in controlling governance, <clears throat> most likely at the AGM each year. So to give you an example, we at Chag Food for nine years, we were a large membership CIC. And every year at the AGM, we would take issues um, like the box price and the growers' wages to the AGM and ask the members to vote on um, whether there should be an increase to both of those, um, those uh, aspects of the business. Um, it's also an AGM is a fantastic opportunity, as Gareth was saying, really, to engage with your members once a year. I think it's a really valuable thing to do. Um, and certainly maybe prompt that so you could potentially Gareth was saying about doing a survey we often sent out a survey maybe two or three weeks in advance of the AGM just to give the members a heads up that the AGM was coming up and <clears throat> to get them thinking about things that they could improve about the business um, it can be very difficult in an AGM scenario in my experience to get constructive criticism um, you tend to get a lot of positive feedback um, and it's much harder to tease out um, those bits of the enterprise that aren't working so well and how those could be improved and resolved. So, <clears throat> yeah, you do need to try um, to overcome um, the English politeness that we all have and actually ask your members genuinely, like, you know, uh, do, they, do they appreciate the quality and quantity of the shares they're getting each week? Um, do they want more of some things, less of others? You know, how could that be improved? A, a good example for us just in the last year, actually, was um, we tried aubergines two years ago as, a, as an experimental crop in our polytunnel. We didn't know how we'd get on with them. Uh, we had very low yields and we only put in half a bed. And as a result, we could only really give the aubergines to the large boxes throughout the season because we never had enough to share between the small and the medium shares. And the feedback at the end of last year was actually people were aware we were growing aubergines and they were a bit up, you know, gutted that they didn't get a chance to, to taste them. <clears throat> so actually this year we've scaled back some of our heritage tomatoes in the polytunnel and doubled the, um, the aubergine bed, basically. So we're going to have double the amount of aubergines. So it's a good example, really, of how you can constantly update what you're doing um, in order to um, improve the service for your members. Um, so, and a small membership CIC, just by contrast, is one in which all member the company um, and it assumes all of the members' directors will make important decisions. Um, <clears throat> there's a good example in Cornwall, Hamas, um, the ha Harrow, Barrow and Metherill Agricultural Society um, is a good, exa good example of a small membership CIC. Um, i trying to think of others, maybe extra community growers, I think there might be one as well, <clears throat> extra CSA. Um, so they... But yeah, it, it differs quite significantly from the from the um, large membership CIC in that it more represents a commun uh, community led CSA compared to a grower led CSA at the other end. <clears throat> Both those models have significant advantages in accessing funding. Um, all three of the grants that we've had at Chag Food in the past 10 years, <clears throat> over £10,000 have only been available to CICs. So particularly in the early stages of startup, um, it, it can be a very attractive model in terms of accessing funding. Uh, that's some of the things I'm aware that, you know, that, um, there's a CSA started down the valley from us in the last year um, and they established as a CIC and they found that particularly in the last 12 months, possibly as a result of COVID and cutbacks and uh, everything else that's been going on, it has been harder to access capital startup funding. So, yeah, that's just a caveat there that you might need to look into it in more detail. Uh, private enterprises, <clears throat> yeah, it's important to recognise that the kick in the most to every CSA or every um, core group or individual involved in the CSA. Um, so you might want to explore from the beginning really a private enterprise model. Um, and that basically gives you more freedom to make day-to-day -day decisions about the business. Um, and <clears throat> you can base it, yeah, it's based on a, a smaller core group um, with less discussion, uh, which you know, it has its pros and cons definitely. Um, but yeah, in our experience, we've worked towards that model over the past 10 years. Just here, I'm going to do a page on, I think it's the last page, yeah, <clears throat> delivering your first season. So I thought I'd have a bit here just to kind of highlight the fact that um, go in with your eyes open. Um, you know, you will realize probably three or four on the line that your first two years are going to be your most challenging. Um, simply because you're getting to know the site, you're getting to know your consumers, you're building a business um, at the same time as doing what can be an incredibly challenging physical job. Um, so leaning on what Gareth was saying earlier in terms of having a board um, of directors that can be a real pro in the, or a real um, asset in terms of supporting your growers in those first in those early years of, of establishment 
um, because all of those supporting roles really take help to take the pressure off of the growers and allow the growers just to concentrate on the on the farming. So there, there can be an argument there for going down the CIC route or at least having a board of directors. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so you're going to be getting to you're going to be skilling up significantly in your first couple of years. You know, I had no idea. When we started Chag Food, I was already quite competent in terms of general farming, you know, growing up working on farms and, you know, I was competent doing tractor driving, fencing, <clears throat> hedge laying, all the rest of it. But I didn't know that I'd need to do marketing, event planning, um, <clears throat> accounting, bookkeeping, um, all of those things, communication, you know, emails, all of that on top. Um, so you will, by default, get skilled up at those things, but it will all come at a cost in the first couple of years. <clears throat> I don't want to put anyone off at all. I encourage you all to go and start up your own CSA, but just be aware that those first two years are going to be challenging and just brace yourself for it because it's better to be, <clears throat> it's better to be um, aware in advance that you're, you're going to have a, a tough time of it. Um, sorry, I hope I'm not being too pessimistic here. <laughs> um, if at all possible, recommend, yeah, to nail as much your business plan well in advance of the, <clears throat> the first Part of the growing season so before march so if possible you know it can't it doesn't always work out this way but if you're planning on starting up a csa try and set aside the winter months maybe december till february <clears throat> to actually plow into all of that business planning stuff get your spreadsheets up and running your know, member spreadsheet your um, accounting software your bookkeeping um, familiarize yourself with all of the the um, business support side of the the work before you actually engage <clears throat> um, in the in the growing side um, because once it takes off in March, particularly in your first year, you're just going to be flat out kind of um, growing, growing stuff and dealing with um, unforeseen issues, I'd suggest. Um, <clears throat> so things to get a head start with include so <clears throat> this again it's not always going to be possible, but and ideally it would be great to have first your first, the, the bulk of your first season members signed up. Um, by the time your first seeds are selling for a couple of reasons really <clears throat> partly because then you don't have to worry about all of that marketing in sort of the April May and June of your first year because most likely if you're starting a CSA from scratch you're not only going <clears> to <throat> you're not going to have your first produce available till the middle end of June so there's that period sort of between March and June where you're doing the work but you're not harvesting anything and you just want to be concentrating on that really <clears throat> so if you can do that membership side and kind of like I say maybe then the autumn and the winter of the preceding season um, that really helps to take the pressure off. <clears throat> um, again, things like a, um, a weekly um, social media mail out or an email newsletter from the January of your first year is quite a good idea in terms of building momentum behind the business. Um, <clears throat> people love photos and seeing what's going on. You'll have loads of photo opportunities in your first year. Um, and if anything, we really regretted not taking enough photos. We were so <clears throat> engaged um, and preoccupied with what was going on on the ground. We didn't make time to actually document what we were doing. Uh, and looking back, it would have been it'd be nice if we had more photos of that early season. So use um, Instagram or social media to your benefit <clears throat> in terms of just giving really quick, snappy updates to your membership um, that their ground, their produce is getting off the ground. You know, it's, it's going in the ground and the project's getting off the ground um, and they're going to be getting produce in their shares um, in a matter of months. Um, marketing, um, again, things to nail really before you start is your logo, your website, flyers, posters, <clears throat> that sort of stuff. Um, consider a FAQ section on your website because you will get a lot of um, repeat questions in your first couple of years, especially as people in your area engage or um, realize what a community supported agriculture scheme is. Um, there'll be a lot of very similar questions about <clears throat> whether they can take a holiday, um, you know, how they pay for the shares, you know, how CSA works, where does CSA come from. All of those things are quite good to put on your website and then you can just direct people there um, rather than having to constantly be on the phone or constantly writing emails, new emails the whole time. Um, <clears throat> again, even though we live in an age of social media and 24-hour news, local newspapers are still, I suggest, a great way of promoting a new enterprise. Um, particularly if you're rooted in a local community, you'll often find that there is um, yeah, local press or parish magazines, um, you know, maybe Facebook, that sort of stuff, but I'm, I'm thinking more of print, print papers, <clears throat> um, and it might seem very um, 19th century to say it, but yeah, we, we used a lot in our first couple of years, um, the local newspapers, because it's free advertising, essentially, you just ping off a press release, tell them you've got an event coming up, or you're, you're starting a market garden, um, and they're always keen for copies, so they'll more often than not send a reporter out with a photographer and get a photo, um, 
you know, we, I think in our first year, we were probably on the front page of the local paper about five or six times, just because they didn't really have much else to talk about. So I think use it, use it to your advantage, definitely, um, free advertising when you can. Um, infrastructure, use winter months, yeah, for particularly things like polytunnels, um, <clears throat> if you can get a calm day, um, not too windy. Uh, certainly fencing, certainly irrigation, staging, packing shed, um, storage facilities, all of that uh, would be great <clears throat> to get established before you throw yourself into the spring of your, um, <clears throat> and your packaging solutions as well so all your packaging make sure you're not caught short you know <clears throat> it's a very common mistake is to grow loads of veg um, and then it gets to the middle of June or the end of June when you're about to deliver your produce to your customers and then to only at that stage to think actually oh yeah we need some packaging <clears throat> and even things like plastic bags um, or biodegradable plastic bags for, for doing salads in can take it can take a while to research which ones to get it can take a while for the orders to come through and in the summer months many suppliers actually do have a, um, a dearth of supply you know they get big orders in and they their stocks full so you might be in a situation where you ring them saying we need plastic bags next week and they can't deliver them for three weeks. So just be aware of all of that stuff beforehand, try and avoid unforeseen or foreseeable uh, issues that might arise. Um, last one there really is machinery. So you may well be starting with limited machinery. Um, <clears throat> but even if you do, um, even just hand tools, um, it's really important to use the winter months to maintain your hand tools, um, re replace handles. Uh, keep them well oiled and cleaned um, have somewhere to store them that's really um we've got like a board where we hang our spades and forks and trowels <clears throat> um, you don't have to do that but it's just it. <clears throat> a clean and tidy workspace really helps to um uh, kind of rough on the rest it helps to create a clean and tidy working environment and the winter is a really good time for getting all of that stuff done um, likewise kind of cultivation subcontractors <clears throat> plowing cultivations can can take place from kind of January onwards as soon as it's dry and if anything we've learned over the years that plowing earlier and then leaving the ground to stand um, in plowed <clears throat> um, upside down furrows is a really good way of um, reducing weed pressure um, at the early season and then we just work up our beds as and when we need them from the plowed furrows. Uh, and the last point there really was to ask advice from other local growers <clears throat> um, or farmers if you're doing livestock um, because there will be <clears throat> there will be growers in your area who you may not be aware of um, and it's worth just getting on Facebook or going to a local allotment group or whatever it might be to find that local knowledge because <clears throat> more often than not you'll have um, elder generations in your community who've had allotments or home gardens who know which varieties work well <clears throat> what the, the, the most challenging pests are um, or the growing conditions so it's worth learning from them use knowledge as much as you can so i think that's it for my tips there just on that bit um so maybe i'll hand back to gareth and we'll stop for five minutes and then we'll come back yeah okay could you um just um somehow um you've ended up as the host can you make me a co-host on your screen now <laughs> so Hello. Uh, no. I can't um, hear you. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I was saying if everyone else goes and has a tea break for five minutes and then I'll sort this out and then um, you're not all waiting for it. So yeah, go for it. Too. Let's start at 12 minutes past, uh, 12 minutes past 12, if that's okay. And then we'll go straight to questions then. Okay. Um, Gareth, I'll have a look. Uh, try and, um, try just and click on my it. name on the list of participants. Okay, great. Thank you. And then it's more. And then I think there's a co-host option. Make co-host. Yeah, got it. And then I think I can. Somebody wants to get in. I think they must have lost a connection or something. Okay. Is that <clears throat> is that done it, Gareth? Yeah, yeah, it has. Yeah, but I'm not quite sure how I let people in. Are you? Have you got a list there of people waiting to come in? Um. No, I don't. Oh, hang on, your screen share. Um, participants, no. Oh, uh, maybe if you turn your screen share off and then. Oh yeah, sorry. Turn my screen share off. Um, stop share. What happened? Yeah, I can't see anyone trying to get in. Can you? No. No. <clears throat> sorry, guys. <laughs> what happens when um CSA growers get? 
get given the, the coordinates for the Zoom meeting. Stick <laughs> 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 to the vegetables. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to go and grab a cup of tea and I'll come yeah, back. I'll, just, I'll be back in a sec. Yeah, I'll just. Um... <laughs> Okay, so That's the polytunnel going, Ed, is it? <laughs> yeah, we got <clears throat> we got it off just this morning, just before I left, and then yeah. I left him in a hurry to come here, and then <clears throat> we're going to try as soon as I get back to get the sheet on. Oh, Luckily, right. we've got a, our landlord <clears throat> at the field where the polytunnel is has got a timber crane. Yeah. Okay. That's a great um, crane on it, so we're going to yeah. lift, um, <clears throat> lift the roll up with yeah. that and then pull it out with a pickup. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Wow. Well, John. And then um, <clears throat> the hope is that, yeah, if there's no no strong wind, then we should just be able to get the sides tapped in um, yeah. as quick as possible. We've got, we got a few extra pairs of hands coming this afternoon, so I think we should be okay. It's just, it's been gusting this morning. The problem is yeah. it, was due, it was due to be like 12 miles an hour, and now it's probably sitting at about sort of 15, 20 miles an hour. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, it sort of goes, we got lo we're having lots of showers here at the moment, and when the showers are on, then it's weird, like a typhoon or something. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't that? <laughs> <laughs> all of all of April's May and all of April's showers in in May, I think. Yeah, right. right. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, are we nearly all back in. I think most people are there, aren't they? Even if we can't see them. Do you want to, Gareth? Should we start from the top of the chats and then okay, yeah, take like... questions one at a time? Maybe if you go first with the questions, and then I'll chip in if I can add anything. Okay. Right. Okay. Um. So just scrolling down here, um, 
So the first questions that uh, Rachel's asked basically, um, are they back, Rachel and Chloe? Yeah. Um, we don't buy anything in and we're just seasonal. So um, basically on both CSAs, we made an, an, an early decision not to buy anything in, um, but just to try and grow a wide, a wide enough range of stuff that we could put some sort of share out all year round. Um, but that obviously involves being in quite close touch with our members and explaining to them what things like the hungry gap mean and keeping them in touch with the weather. For instance, this year, the hungry gaps you know, got a potential, well, particularly now we're struggling a bit because it's been really cold to this point. So everything's really slow. Um, and obviously over the years, we've built up the number of polytunnels we've got to bring the seasons um, forward and, and put them back a bit. So um, this year we've been struggling a bit, but um, well, at Five Acre, for example, we produce pot plants. So we've given everybody cucumbers and, and stuff to, well, not cucumbers, but um, herbs particularly to take home and grow themselves and things like that. Um, we've got drying beans that we can put in a hungry gap share. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, if you've got enough polytunnels, often the hungry gap, to my mind, is not a huge issue, but it does mean that, I mean, at Canal Side, we've got seven large polytunnels, you know, so um, you can normally fill the gap. And then the creative use of other crops like rhubarb, um, asparagus, if you can get it to grow, we've, we've not had much success with that. Um, Jerusalem artichokes, things like that, you know, that you can put in um, hungry gap shares. So I don't know, Ed, what's your, you're probably put more closer to it than me, but. <clears throat> yeah, so we, um, <clears throat> we actually, for our first six years, we, um, we didn't supply through the hungry gap. So we were a seasonal CSA. So we, um, <clears throat> in 2015, based on an AGM actually, where we had a really good um, discussion with the members, we discussed the option of buying in um, to fill the boxes to make it a year round CSA. From our perspective, there was a couple of main benefits. The biggest one probably was in terms of recruiting new members. So there was always a challenge <clears throat> when you're a seasonal CSA in communicating that to the customers, particularly if you offer the option of splitting an annual payment over 12 months. <laughs> because you're, you're always going to have this situation where um, people are paying in April, May and June. They're paying their subscription and not receiving any veg, uh, which is a really hard sell. <laughs> um, and also it restricts when you can sign up new customers, because the last thing you really want to do is sign up a new member in January, February or March <clears throat> when they start paying their subscription. And then a month later, the veg stops and then they don't receive anything until June. So for us, that was kind of a prompting factor that it was actually limiting our uptake. So we were stuck at about <clears throat> 70 members. For about three years and we were struggling to get above 70 members um, and it was partly through Gareth and Dom coming down from Canal Side and giving us kind of a, 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 a advice session they kind of strongly recommended going for the year-round model even if it meant we had to buy in for me personally it was a little bit of a, um, a philosophical dilemma because um, we started out Chagford with very strong moral intentions to only supply what we could um, produce on people's doorsteps so stepping away from that for me felt like quite a philosophical um, jump. But having said that, through the AGM process, actually, and through discussing with the members, we kind of reached this compromise where we made a firm commitment to only ever buy from Devon based organic producers. Um, <clears throat> and um, being from uh, born and bred in Devon, I'm passionate about Devon. And actually, that kind of sold it to me. I was like, well, actually, you know, if we're keeping the money within the economy in Devon, um, that's it's much better than buying produce even from, you know, Somerset, Dorset, let alone from the southeast. <clears throat> so that's kind of where we got to. So in 2016, we made that transition to year round boxes. And as a result, we put the box price up by about two pounds a week <clears throat> through the season. So it's about 100 pounds per share. Um, for the year that the prices went up. Um, but we communicated to the members that actually in real terms, that was actually a price decrease because they were actually getting boxes for 51 weeks of the year. Um, <clears throat> even though they were paying hundred pounds extra, the actual box price itself was going down. So it was, qu it was quite an e easy sell. Um, and as a direct result of going to that year round model, we actually picked up 30 new members within the space of about three months. So we went from 70 to hundred <clears throat> um, in about three months, which was obviously great for cash flow. Um, so yeah, my advice really is kind of <clears throat> play it by ear, see how you get on, but there is a very strong argument for going to the year round model and not just sticking with seasonal, I'd say. Yeah, quite a lot of CSAs um, buy produce in for, the, for that hungry gap. And I think 
you know, and a lot of them like Stroud, for example, yes, they have a commitment to buy very local, don't they? And I think that's legitimate as well, you know, there's no, no problem with that. So, yeah. um, uh, Kate has asked, um, the company limited by guarantee, how do we show this is not for profit? Normally that should be in your article somewhere that says you're a not for profit company. Um, so what that means effectively is that when the company's wound up, no one individual can benefit. Um, and it says that you basically have to dis dispose of your assets to another charity or like-minded organization. So um, that's how it works. I mean, it is basically the article in your, in your, in your, in your company documents that say you're a not-for-profit basically with them. Um, I think they call it an asset lot technically. Um, so that if, if you've got that article in there, then you are technically a not-for-profit, basically. Um, does that answer your question, Kate? Where are you? Oh. Uh, you're on mute. I can't see it. Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, that's it. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you. We've got, um, we're a CIC for the other projects that we've been running over the last few years, and yeah. that's got the asset lock and it's all yeah. in the articles. Um, but this now we've, we've um, set up as a limited by guarantee, um, yeah. but we haven't actually got articles for that right now. So we write those then. Uh, I mean, I know we've got, because we're yeah. just starting this up now. So, but in the articles, we just say that we have an asset lock and we are not. Uh, yeah, you, you should be able to find some articles that you can yeah. use with, with an asset lock in, basically. Yeah. Um, and as far as I'm aware, that's the main difference between uh, the types of companies. That's great. Thank you. Okay. That's, that's really helpful. Okay. Yeah. Is that your experience, Ed? Do you think? Is that... Yeah, certainly it was. Uh, yeah, the articles when you're CIC, your constitution and your articles association uh, basically are the, the roadmap for how your business operates. Um, <clears throat> but they can, it's more direct nice, they can be um, uh, adjusted over time. So as long as you've got the directors or the directors in agreement, you can actually go back historically or, and update your articles at any point. Um, so we okay. actually recently did that as an example when we were transitioning and buying the assets from the business. We went back to our articles and actually named the specific beneficiaries who are going to benefit from the capital money that we were paying for the asset. Um, so you can, in that instance, you can go back and, and change the articles. Yeah, so Ed, I'm really interested in the fact that you have transitioned to be a private enterprise now. I kind of really understand why you've done that as well. Um, and so is that a not-for-profit that you are now or you're just a private company? No, we're just a private, <clears throat> we're a private company partnership, me and myself and my wife. Yeah, so... Yeah. Yeah, I kind that's of, an option as well as a C, CSA. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the, I mean, the CSA simply describes the model of um, distribution and marketing. Um, okay. And it's, I, I would argue it, it describes a philosophy as well, um, yeah. which Gareth alluded to very importantly at the beginning, which is sharing the risks and rewards. Yeah. So from my perspective, I mean, um, it is, it is a, it's a, it's a grey area at the moment within the UK CSA community. But from my personal perspective, you kind of need two things to be a CSA. You need um, a commitment, a seasonal commitment to pay for a share, whether that's paid annually or monthly, but you need that commitment from the consumer to support the farm for an entire season. And on top of that, you need an acceptance that they're sharing the risks as well as the rewards of the enterprise. And in, pra in practice, what that means is in a bad season, um, so like 2012 is a great example, um, our second year of growing, it was a horrific season. There was low light levels, the produce, it rained every single day, the produce was rotting in the fields. Whereas in our first two years, we had supplied for 37 weeks. <clears throat> um, in our third year in 2012, we were only able to supply for 25 weeks of the season. Um, but as a result, our members really got a uh, first-hand experience of what sharing the risks and rewards meant. Um, and we, we lost many members that year, but actually we retained about 40 members. And because they've been through two good seasons and a bad season, they were then with us for long. I mean, we've now probably got the majority of those 40 members still six years later. Um, <clears throat> and to me, that just really highlighted the, um, the, the fantastic, um, the unique model basically that is CSA, um, that it really, once people get it, they really get it and they really understand why they need to support the farmers and also why we can achieve affordability because of that. 
you know, our, yeah. our affordability hinges on the fact that we have a guaranteed market. If we didn't have that guaranteed market, we'd need to be factoring all sorts of losses associated with growing and harvesting produce that's not being sold. Um, so it's really important to communicate that, constantly to communicate that to your members. Thank you. And that's all about educating people around seasonal yeah. growing and, and working with the seasons of nature, isn't it, anyway? Absolutely, yeah. I think it's really Thank important you. communication yeah. with your members in that sense, you know, keeping them informed about, you know, like this year we've been, you know, the story is that it's been really cold and dry, you know, well, until this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got some sun. <laughs> um, Okay, thank you. And it's, it's, sorry, I've just got one more question around the, the being a private enterprise or being um, uh -huh. with an asset lock. So presumably, if we're looking for grant funding for set up and capital, then it's much more easier to access if we are not for profit with asset lock. But is it possible still to access some sort of start up business grants if we are just a private enterprise? <clears throat> It is possible. It's much harder, and you're much much more likely to get a loan. You're much more likely to get a business loan, a bank, uh, yeah, business startup loan. Um, there may be COVID-specific grants that are available that I'm not fully aware of, but um, no, I'd say in my experience, in terms of accessing capital funding to get yourselves off the ground, the CIC model or some form of community enterprise model um, is is kind of essential for that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Rachel and Chloe have asked um, what is health and safety? Um, well, the long and short of it is that um, all companies have a legal duty to ensure that their, Sorry, um, Sarah, didn't, their that, workplace and practices are safe. Sarah? <laughs> yeah? It's not what I was asking. Sorry. Uh, um, oh, right. It's because you put H and E. In oh, your... sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't. <laughs> but yeah, that's um, that's what you get in a hospital. That's accident and emergency. Yeah, it? right. <laughs> Got yeah, right. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, right. I mean, it's just that you've got to have some sort of health and safety policy in place, basically. Uh, I think that's a legal requirement. Um, uh, so, um. Oh, um, do you have those policies? Would we, either of you, would we be able to see your written policies? Yeah, you should be able to go onto Canal Side's website and see our H and uh, health and safety policy. It should be there. If it's not, just send me an email and I'll mail it to you. Okay. Uh, yeah, same. It's probably easier if you, if you do want to copy, just ping me an email and I'll send them through to you. Yeah. Great. And that, that goes for everyone else. If you want copies of any policy documents, I'm quite happy to send them. I mean, I kind of view CSA as an open source farming method. I don't, you know, I'm hoping that there's no secrets between CSA farmers, basically. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, can I can I just echo that? I think, um, yeah, my experience in 10 years of working on CSAs, you are unlikely to encounter another enterprise, a field of enterprise where there is so much mutual support um, because basically because we can see it's the future. <laughs> People are involved in CSAs. Um, we are absolutely convinced um, that it's the way to supply local food <clears throat> in a responsible, you know, socially, environmentally, ethically responsible manner. Um, and we do everything we can to support more CSAs to start up. Um, and as a result, I think it's really worth just echoing something I said earlier. Just if you are aware of their CSAs nearby you and you're thinking of starting up, go and talk to them and you will find 99% of the time, you'll find they'll be fully supportive of you starting a CSA up and do everything they can to help you. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a question here from Kate again, really. It was around the seasonal veg. I think, did we deal with that? adequately i think didn't we yeah so um um so um lisa's asking well how did how do we get started before an income comes in i think ed's already talked a bit about this um in his first year um, um bit of his talk um in the case of canal side and um and five acre we we basically um asked people to start well, we, first of all, we tried to get people, we encouraged people to pay for the whole first year up front. So we had the money in, in the bank and they were taking a risk then uh, for the whole first year. So that gave us some cash. We also asked for people to start their share offer on a certain date, but with no guarantee of them getting, you know, the share or what would be in it for a certain period of time. Uh, and that worked as well. Um, and, um, the third thing was people who were really keen, we asked them to actually lend us money 
So in both cases, we got about £10,000 of loans from members, um, which we then paid back when we had, when basically when we had a good cash flow, basically. Um, in terms of grants in Five Acre, we did actually get a, a grant, but to buy equipment, basically. So we got a lottery, um, is it Healthy Communities grant or something to buy basically equipment that we needed. Um, uh, at the time, we were lucky because we, Garden Organic had tractors and things that we could use, which we have actually subsequently bought as well, you know, so, so uh, we own, own all that now. But it is a bit, I, I think it's inevitable that you are probably going to need to look, look for some sort of lump sum to buy some equipment up front. Is that true, would you say, Ed? Yeah, absolutely. You, uh, you're going to struggle enormously to do it. Otherwise, I think, yeah, so in our experience, we got a £38,000 grant from making local food work, big lottery, in our first year. Um, admittedly, that took about a year of, well, not a year, but it took probably a day a week on my part for about 12 months beforehand, putting in the work for the business plan, the planning applications, all the paperwork that was needed for that grant application. Um, and yeah, we were fortunate more than anything that it was successful. Um, looking back, we probably should have asked, well, we, we could have asked for double uh, and it would have um, supported us, you know, better. Um, but certainly that was like a minimum. I don't think even if we had got 20,000 pounds um, because we had no personal capital to get started with, even 20,000 pounds, I think we probably would have struggled to buy all of the things that we needed and to support ourselves for the first couple of years. So um, just echoing something Gareth said earlier, I think is a really strong, strong business policy to not take grants for revenue. Um, I think that sets you up in a really strong position long term. For us, we didn't have that op uh, opportunity early on. So we actually took our original um, Making Local Food Work grant was for revenue as well as capital. And it basically subsidized the growers wages for the first two years. But what that did was it allowed us to offer the first season's shares for a significantly reduced price. I think it was 290 pounds we asked people to pay for the first year. Um, <clears throat> and that was really just as a way of buffering against them taking a huge punt on an enterprise that wasn't yet started. So we got the 38,000 pound grant. And then on top of that, we also got about 8,000 pounds. I think I remember from, from those 25 first households who supported us with a upfront payment. Um, <clears throat> then in our second year, I think we introduced monthly payments um, and we made it clear to those first year members that that would be a one season only op opportunity. And after that, the price would be going up to reflect um, the running costs. So that's also a model you might want to might want to think about, like a, a subsidized first year, but with a clear explanation that in the second year, that's going to go up um, in order to cover the running costs of the farm. Mm -hmm. um, Jesse's basically asking, should it be fun and enjoyable? Well, <laughs> yeah, well, yes. <laughs> I mean, for me, the fun and enjoyment was really running a lot of events and learning activities and things that people could get involved in, you know, and I mean that, you know, it's, all, it's always great to after a work morning or something to have a fire and people share a beer and some food and, and stuff like that. I mean, in a sense, you know, it's not, you know, low key enjoyment being outside is just enjoyable for me you know that's I guess that's that's where I am I don't know Ed if you've got anything to add to that <laughs> yeah I would say yeah first and foremost it's um it's, it's about quality of life so you know, yeah, yeah I said two weeks ago you're never going to do this job to get rich um but you will have a phenomenal quality of life I I suggest in my experience um you will know yourselves whether you you enjoy spending time outdoors or whether you enjoy spending time in front of a computer and I think it's really important that the world has people who can do both of those things but if you know yourself that you're not happy in a job <clears throat> that's based indoors um, where you spend significant portion of your time out of the elements um, then it makes sense it just makes sense for you to be outdoors doing a job that you love you know if you're doing a job 40 hours a week um, for 30 years of your life you want to make it count really so I think that should be your starting point is like where is your where is your enjoyment um, where is your heart with your livelihood um, and if you're, it feels like an incredibly fortunate position. I, I'm, I still don't take it for granted. Like every week, I still count my blessings that I have a job after 10 years that I absolutely thoroughly love and enjoy. Um, <clears throat> but I think as well, just going back to what I was saying, it is quality of life. You know, you're, you know, I, I've grown up in a rural area, which is probably one of the most desirable places to live in the country in you know, Chagford on Dartmoor. And I, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to afford to buy a house um, in the community in which I've grown up. You know, where I'm going to spend the rest of my life renting properties or you know, we own a bit of land where we might get planning permission. 
but I think you do need to factor those things in. And for me, you know, it was a bit, it wasn't, it didn't take, you know, to me a couple of seconds to make that decision. Actually, you know, that's a small price to pay. Not owning my own home is a small price to pay for a livelihood that I can wake up and, and love and enjoy. I always think actually about Sunday evenings. Um, you know, on a Sunday evening, a lot of people around the country are dreading going into work on a Monday morning. Uh, but for me, Sunday evening, I'm actually really looking forward to getting to work on a Monday morning and getting stuck back in into the, into the job. So I think if you can be in that position, you're probably among one, some of the most fortunate people in the, in the country. So bear that in mind, I would say, as you yeah, go. Right. Um... So, I mean, Rachel and Chloe have, are talking about, um, you know, they're feeling a bit overwhelmed and, and having weekly check-ins. And I, I think, yeah, that's brilliant. I think um, the more that your staff and your board teams communicate with each other and the more opportunities you give them to do that, it's, it's, you know, a stress shared is a load shared, isn't it? You know, basically, I mean, that, that would be nice. And, and kind of a lot of our... Um, of our events and things are actually geared up towards helping people communicate with each other basically rather than us teaching them specifically but, but i mean that's yeah yeah I'd, I'd echo that i'd also say it is you know obviously again not wanting to put anyone off at all but there are months of the year in the farming calendar that are stressful you know that's just a fact of life there are the, it's a very seasonal occupation so for us you know we're kind of in the midst of the busiest time so march april may and june are really your peak seasons uh, peak months in terms of activity on the market garden um and as long as you're aware of that then you can kind of factor in time to rest and recuperate in october november december january you know you can you know we've now got to the point at chang food 10 years down the line we're actually for november december january we actually work three days a week on the field um and i do a, a day a week doing forestry doing other stuff you know and you know, a day a week kind of with the kids and all the rest of it so you can if you know that that time is coming up then those four peak months actually are much more achievable and much more manageable because you kind of prepare yourself for that you know it's going to be hectic but you also know that you're going to get that lull <clears throat> towards the end of the season um, and having said that, yeah, it is also still, it's, it's really enjoyable work, you know, even when it's busy, um, you're doing physical active work outside, ideally with a, with a team of people who you work well with and have good camaraderie. For us, one of the great things we've discovered over the past six years has been the apprentices, um, having new apprentices every year, <clears throat> bring in kind of fresh perspective, um, fresh outlook, um, you know, fresh banter. Um, a lot of a lot of the field work actually comes down to the banter. If you can have a laugh with people while you're doing the job, um, then that counts for a lot. Um, so yeah, remember to have a sense of humour even when things are, are tough. Um, and you, yeah, that will that will stand you in good stead as well. I would say. Yeah. I think um, sort of skipping over the question from Kate, which I think we aren't we we answered, didn't we, Kate, about um, access to grants. Um, um, a very specific question. Um, does anyone know of any non-plastic <laughs> bags for veg, Ed? <laughs> it's a difficult one, isn't it? <laughs> it is a difficult one. So we're kind of in, in this country, we're in this kind of um, transition yeah. at the moment where there is a lot of research and development going into yeah. biodegradable <clears throat> plastics. At the moment, unfortunately, we've got two options. We've either got um, fully biodegradable plastic bags, which are like the, um, the potato starch ones you get in your um, compost caddy, um, which are kind of like a slightly stretchy um, starch yeah. material, um, which are great because they can go on the compost heap and they will rot within a matter of weeks. But the problem is they actually make the salad sweat, we found with leafy greens, particularly if you wash it before delivery, <clears throat> it really doesn't last very long at all. So the alternative is to buy non-biodegradable plastic bags that have got holes, perforated holes in them that actually allow the product to breathe a bit. So we are actually in a compromise at the moment where we've got a, um, a, a vegware, we use vegware, a company, they do a, a degradable plastic bag, um, but it's not, it's not biodegradable, it can't go on the compost heap. Um, but we try and, the main thing we try and do is get to our members to reuse them as much as possible. So we encourage members, every couple of months we'll put a reminder in the newsletter for people to wash their bags you know stick them on a wooden spoon on the drying rack is usually the best way to dry them turn them inside out <clears throat> and then fold them up and return them in the box obviously through covid we couldn't do that we were limited on the amount of returns we can get but i think as, as things are relaxing a bit that's something that we're going to reintroduce um, to start trying to reuse um, rather than compost the bags but i think it's something that's going to change uh, from everything i hear through the land workers alliance we do kind of regular reviews on where we are with biodegradable packaging market 
um, and constantly things are changing. Riverford actually in December, they made an announcement that all of their packaging is going to be biodegradable within two years, um, which is basically going to drive the industry. You know, if Riverford are making that commitment, then that means there's going to be a lot of research and development going to meet that market because Riverford is a huge market. So along with a lot of other things, we're going to end up piggybacking on the back of Riverford's research and development. Uh, but I think it's coming. That's great, thanks. Can I just um, check with you? So the, the actual starch-based ones that do degrade, they're quite opaque, aren't they? They're quite milky. Mm, yeah. And I think, yeah, because that's the problem for us with the um, the edible flower salads, because we like to show them. But also, it's really good feedback to hear that they um, they do sweat. We, we're just, at the moment, we use a... Um, uh, a recycled um, paper with a sort of uh, biodegradable starch insert but of course that doesn't keep them either but we just stick a thing on saying please decant into a Tupperware or something when you get it home because we just don't want to go back we just don't want to be doing the single-use plastic yeah. Um, yeah. or even the the plastic that degrades but it's it degrades because it is it is actual plastic but it's been sprayed so We've just we've just been looking for months and years trying to find the right thing and keep trying to do things. So yeah, I mean that's great, really good to hear um, that that's sort of coming. Yeah, thank you. Much. Yeah, I don't know if anybody else has got any any experiences with plastic packaging. I mean, it is a, as Ed's already hinted, it's quite an open sort of question at the moment. But with grounds for optimism, in the next year or two, it will be sorted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, just on the plastic bags for salad at uh, um, Stroud CSA, the, the veg CSA, they started that, um, they put all their salad like in a big plastic box yeah. and because everyone has to, well nearly everyone comes to collect their own, then you weigh out your own salad and so you can stick it in a paper bag kind of knowing that you're just taking it home and, and it's kind of as a as a member it's like your responsibility how you package your salad then but they're providing it in a giant plastic box that you have to weigh it out yourself so that was their strategy for reducing plastic bag use obviously it doesn't work if you're doing drop-offs but it worked for that collection kind of system yeah we we do that at canal side we basically harvest the salad into big rubble sacks and, and to keep it fresh and then people weigh their own out and, um, yeah, uh, but we also have a return system like Ed, you know, we, uh, we the in inevitably people don't bring their plastic <laughs> plastic bags, so we have a system whereby they, we ask them to bring, you know, if they take them to make a donation uh, and use them again, you know, as possible. Uh, I suppose ultimately just jump in there the ultimately as CSAs we should be yeah. striving to supply our produce as um, close to harvest as possible yeah. uh, and also as locally as possible so the goal is really that it shouldn't you know our produce shouldn't be in plastic bags for long um, for us you know we we harvest all of our leafy greens in fact we harvest everything for our boxes apart from the potatoes and onions on the Thursday on the day we deliver so when people arrive at the collection point at five o'clock on a Thursday they know that that produce was growing less than 12 hours ago <clears throat> so it's actually got they've got a bit of leeway you know even if that sits in the fridge for a couple of days it's still going to be relatively fresh um, certainly and they certainly notice compared to going to the supermarket or to Riverford or you know buying organic salad leaves anywhere else that have come from you know, 20, 50, 100, 200 miles away, um, there'll be a massive um, contrast in quality and freshness, um, which will, the members will, will recognise. I think that kind of leads into the next question, really, which is the best setup for harvesting and keeping greens fresh. I mean, really, when it is hot, it's basically coming in and doing it early in the morning, you know, before people pick, you know, literally hours before people pick it up. <laughs> And, and, and that's, you know, that's what we do, you know, and I mean, I know it's a bit of a pain to have to come in at six or whatever, but, but you know, that is the best way to keep them fresh. Um, yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah. Early morning harvesting. Um, obviously, there's a challenge if it is either end of the season, you've got a frost, you've got to wait yeah. till the frost is off the leaves. But um, no, by and large, from June onwards, we'll be harvesting at 6.30 in the morning. The, the leafy greens, that includes the kales and the chards as well, because they lose quality as soon as the sun really gets on them. If you're harvesting, particularly the kales um, and the chard, actually, um, after they've had even an hour of sun, <clears throat> then you'll notice that by the end of the day, they're starting to become a bit limp as well. Oh. So we try and get them harvested early. Um, a cold store is a massive asset <clears throat> to any market garden. 
So if you are able to access either mains electric or a solar setup where you can have um, a refrigerated unit, that will massively <coughs> increase um, your flexibility in terms of harvest. So for instance, we harvest um, tomatoes and courgettes on a Monday as well as a Thursday, because otherwise our courgettes would be marrows by a Thursday. So we put all of our courgettes and tomatoes into a, a chiller um, and that keeps them fresh then to the Thursday and they, they join the other Thursday harvest then. Um, and we, yeah, we distribute it all together. So if you can fact that in from early on, kind of budgeting for a cold store, even if it's a small one, even a catering size fridge, that you can get crates in um, is certainly better than any alternative. You know, in the past, for the early years, we had to just put things um, in the shade. We hosed it down with a sprinkler, put tea towels over them and then kept them in the shade, which which helped keep the worst of the, the warmth off. Um, but there's no substitute really for a chiller at four, four to six degrees um, for keeping stuff fresh. Yeah, we have um, at Canal Side, we have two solar powered kind of deep, um, you know, chest bridges, basically. So. Um, which is, helps take the field heat out of the um, uh, veg. So, yeah. Um, can I just ask about that? Sorry. Um, yeah. Is there a way you can send any details about the solar powered fridges? Because that's something we're really interested in. Yeah, right. Oh, well, I mean, they're just basically solar panels. Um, well, in this case, they are 12 volt fridges, but you can oh, just run an ordinary fridge off, off, off the solar system with an inverter. Yeah. Okay, um, all right, that's great. Uh, but uh, yeah, I can send you, uh, I think I can send you details. If you drop me an email, I'll, I can send you the, the specific system that we've got if you want to. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's quite expensive. <laughs> um, just always trying to find different ways that go yeah. because we're off grid. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, so um, Jennifer's asking basically, are there any recommendations for tools to do online surveys? Um, just speaking from my own personal experience, I um, uh, personally, I don't think so. I, I, if I want to know what the members think, I stand there and talk to them as they come to pick up their veg. <laughs> it's probably, you know, and you get so much more of a rich experience, you know, because anything that you do online is actually limited by your own preconception, isn't it, about what, what answer you're expecting to find in a sense. And you can't develop the conversation, basically, you know. So, so it's, a, it's as Ed said earlier that, um, um, you know, in a polite meeting, you always get the answer that people expect you want to hear in a sense, you know, so, so whereas if you develop a conversation with them, you can draw out all sorts of different things, you know, and, 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 and sort of really learn about what they really think, you know, so um, my, I always say to people personally, you have to put the legwork in and put the time aside to actually just talk to people. Um, and I, I appreciate if you're dropping boxes off and things that might not be so easy, but you know, there's always events and things on the farm and like having a fire and some soup is just a great way of talking to people basically. And, yeah. and um, how you formalize that recording or not is up to you, but you make, make notes or have, um, we quite often just have a, a very open list of questions that the steering committee wants to know answers to, but we don't stick to it rigidly, you know, we can, but you can fill it in after after you've talked to people and with what they thought, you know. So um, personally, that's my favourite way of doing it. But I do appreciate that it does take time, and <laughs> you need to uh, to develop that kind of personal contact. You know, so yeah, uh, <clears throat> I was jumping there. Um, yeah, absolutely. What Gareth said. I mean, there's no substitute for a personal conversation. Um, and ideally, if you can have a one on one conversation, it's much easier to get that constructive criticism than um, mm. in a group of people where people are less willing to, to give that mm. up readily. Um, I would say, however, in the past, we have used SurveyMonkey um, mm. as a uh, an email. Um, yeah, um, people will be familiar with it, but it's like a, it's a template where you can set up a list of questions and then you, it pings it out in an email to a, a, whoever you want to send it to. And then they, in their own time, they can fill it out. Um, you might want to incentivize, if you are going down that route, you might want to incentivize uptake with maybe a discount on a veg box or I don't know, <clears throat> a week's free veg box. I don't know how you do it or maybe some extras just because people are so inundated with emails and requests for online stuff these days that um, understandably they don't want to spend any more time looking at their computers. So you might struggle with uptake with it, <clears throat> but certainly a, 
a one-to-one -one conversation, if you can factor in the time for it and the opportunity is the best way by far. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so Jesse, I, um, BDA certification, what, what was your take on this? Where are you? <laughs> Um, yeah, sorry, that's just uh, my day job is working for BDA certification, doing organic <laughs> certification, and my boss said, you've got to put a plug in. <laughs> 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 but I think, it, it, like, seriously, it's worth people knowing that it, you don't just have to go to the Soil Association if you want organic yeah, certification. Yeah. There are several certification bodies, and there are pros yeah. and cons with the different ones. Yeah. yeah, so the BDA is the biodynamic one, yeah, is that? Yeah, but yeah, we do right. organic okay. certification too. Yeah, and the, yeah, there's the soil associations, there's the organic farmers and growers as well, isn't there? And, and a few others as well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, no, that's a valid point. You don't have to go to the soil association. Right? <laughs> Although we do. <laughs> um, um, the other open question really for CSAs is, uh, um, we really are certified as a point of right we're kind of supporting the soil association in a sense i mean i think a lot of csas are not actually you know you could ask yourself whether you need to be certified i, I don't know whether you, um i don't know ed what would your take be on it certification yeah um <clears throat> yeah i do i mean possibly echoing what i was saying about my strong philosophical um leanings yeah. when we started chag food we feel very much that we need to work towards a future where everyone can access local, fresh, organic mm -hmm. produce. Um, <clears throat> and ultimately, my personal preference is that everyone should be in a fortunate enough position to know the individuals who are growing their food. Uh, and that's why the CSA model is so fantastic. It, it has so much integrity with that regard. Um, the only thing, yeah, so to counter, I mean, I think the BDA do a fantastic job and I think certification bodies um, have done a fantastic job over the, the past three decades at educating consumers about the benefits of eth socially and environmentally ethically um, produced food. But I suppose, yeah, from a very purist point of view, I would say we should be working towards a point where certification bodies become redundant in the sense that, and this is nothing against the BDA or the Soil Association, it's purely from a practical level <clears throat> that, you know, my vision for local food in the country is that everyone should have access to a CSA where they know their growers, they know the, the land where their food is coming from, and they have an opportunity to get involved in that. Um, <clears throat> so to that end, yeah, I, I would suggest we should be working towards that point, but I accept we've got 20, 30, 40 years to that point. So until we get there, yeah, the BDA Soil Association, OF and G, do a fantastic job at, um, at providing that um, assurance um, that, that the food is being produced to a certain standard. Yeah, um, Jennifer, I've, I've, I've not personally had much experience with crowdfunding myself, but do you want to just tell us a bit about what? Oh. Well, mm, um, all I can say was it was remarkably successful, really. I think yeah. it was just sort of through sort of social media. And uh, I think we just, you know, you had to have it in a certain sort of time span. Yeah. Anyway, it's just, I'm afraid I wasn't that involved in actually setting it up. But I think there is, it's all out there on the web, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, I think. Yeah. But, did, you, did you use it to set up or was it just for, yeah i mean yeah. we did it basically a year ago so it was literally just pre-covid so um i think it finished in january or february yeah. and um a lot of it was through people giving fairly small amounts but yeah, then we were right, also yeah. very very fortunate some people gave quite large amounts and then it got sort of matched funded as it were by somebody a local benefactor yeah. we're able to raise quite you know it, it really has yeah. helped us to sort of give us that start up yeah. so if it's hard accessing that probably you know the whole grant thing might be quite a lot of competition now and a kind of lot of sort of ticking boxes and trying to fit the criteria Whereas crowdfunding is, is just about telling your story, really, and getting yeah. people locally. And we promoted it very locally. And because where we are, there's, you know, quite a big centre of population. So it's definitely something worth considering, yeah. I would say. For when you, yeah. yeah, OK. So that's another way um, that, um, you know, for, for 
people who were asking about stuff that was if crowdfunding can work as well. Um, I would say, <coughs> sorry, Gareth, I was just going to say something. Yeah, carry on. We, we've never done a crowdfunder, but I know several CSAs who've done it very successfully. One thing I'd say, just to echo what I was saying about local press earlier, it can be a very similar thing where just through doing a crowdfunding campaign, it's a very useful opportunity to raise the profile of what you're doing to a much wider audience. And I'm sure many CSAs who have <clears throat> had crowdfunding campaigns in the past have benefited from getting members as a result of those crowdfunding campaigns as well. Um, just as an add on to that, um, I would just say that I think it's really important when we are doing crowdfunding campaigns or any actually any fund uh, exterior fundraising for CSAs that we highlight the fact that um, the policy needs to change that actually there needs to be a, a huge overhaul. I mean, there is being an overhaul of um, agricultural um, uh, spending. I mean, we live in a, a per perverse situation where we spend 3.6 billion pounds a year in this country paying landowners simply for owning land. <clears throat> There's no requirement that land is used to produce food for local people, let alone for this country. You know, a lot of that land is being used to produce commodities that are exported. And I think is every time we can re-educate or, or at least educate consumers that that is going on then we can encourage them to talk to their MPs to actually get change at a policy level, to redirect that money to actually the farms that need it most are actually delivering high quality produce to local, local communities. Um, and it'd be great to get to a point where CSA is actually recognized as a fundable um, model through public, yeah. public money, basically, I would say. Um, I guess the other thing I could mention as a sort of precursor to our crowdfunder, we did quite a lot of awareness raising by just having a stall at things like a farmer's market. They let us have one very sort of cheaply just for a fiver or something, not really to sell stuff, but just to tell people this is what we want to do. Just getting it out there, really. So we already had a list of people who said, oh, yes, I'm interested in that idea. So I guess, you know, it was everybody on that list that we contacted for crowdfunding when we actually had to run the campaign, which you do over a fairly short period of time. So I guess, you know, you need to do that bit of sort of legwork beforehand just to get it out there wherever you can. Can I yeah. ask you how much you crowdfunded for? We, we, well, we raised, we raised from individuals something like um, £22,000. Oh, right, yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah so it's well worth doing but i mean your advice is generally to put the you have to put the groundwork in to, to do that so. i think that really made a difference yeah, yeah right yeah. Yeah. okay um rianne is asking um do we ask our members to pack our own boxes um at canal side and five acre the short answer is yes we put that we harvest into crates uh we put the crates out with a weight and they pack their own boxes. Um, uh, I appreciate that not all CSAs can do that because they're, maybe they're not allowed to generate too much traffic or, or other considerations or they're too remote or whatever, but um, that's our basic model, yes. It's, it's, we cut out on all the distribution costs basically and, the pack and most of the packaging costs by asking people to pack their own um, stuff. So I think, Ed, you, you, you do some distribution and stuff, don't you? Yeah, so all of our, um, we, we we distribute all of our, well, I, I say that, we've probably got three members who come to the farm who come every Thursday because they volunteer on a Thursday anyway. Um, <clears throat> but no, 99% of our veg is distributed through um, central collection points. So yeah, in, it's, it's certainly got pros and cons. So yeah, mm. one of them, one of the pros is that from our perspective, it actually it does simplify packing day. We're doing, we have three sizes of box, small, medium and large. <clears throat> That's the only parameters. Um, so we're not doing, as I said earlier, we're not doing individual orders at all. We just, you know, it makes it very simple for everyone in the packing mm. shed. Um, um, to, to get the boxes packed and it means that's the way we can do it in one day basically uh the downside i suppose is that it is a, it is a cost in terms of labor in terms of um, time um the whole of thursday is written off for us for packing and delivering the boxes um whereas with you know with gareth with canal side i suspect their their distribution model is a lot more streamlined in terms of just putting the veg in crates and then the members come and it's the members time <coughs> that's used to to pack uh, and distribute the veg um, and on top of that, I mean, that is the goal. Ultimately, you know, the, the canal side model, the head top and veld model in Belgium, that is the pinnacle of CSA. If you can get your members coming to the farm every week, they have no opportunity to, bec to become disconnected um, from the seasons, from the weather or from the growers. 
um, for me, those are the three tenants really of kind of reinforcing the, the <clears throat> CSA model. Um, we, we mooted it in our third year, I think. We, at our AGM, we said to the members, um, we would like to consider going to a collection model. Um, how many of you could, would be up for that, coming to the farm to collect the veg? And I think at the time we probably had about 70 members and I think it was probably about four or five <laughs> said they would be up for coming to the farm. And again, that echoes what I was saying at the very beginning about being restrictive to begin with and not <clears throat> being too flexible. So, you know, if you start with a model, if you start with a self-collection model, um, then yes, it might, it might limit your initial intake, but those members will be there for the long term, you know, and they'll be constantly coming to the farm. Uh, and I suspect you will reap benefits through long term um, support and retention, um, the more the members come to the farm. For us, it's always key to get people to come to the farm before they sign up for a veg box. Not always, but it really helps. You know, it's very different to talking about a CSA at a market stall or a, an, an event somewhere. Once they come to the farm and see the polytunnels, see the veg growing, it's a very easy sell then essentially just from a purely marketing perspective. So try and bear that in mind in terms of signing up your initial customers. Um, there's one, we're almost out of time, I think, but uh, there's one last question here from Rachel and Chloe talking about steering committees and boards. Um, I think, it, I, I mean, in the case of Canal Southern Five Acre, it really harks back to what Ed was saying that when you set up your CSA, you're going to rely on a few individuals putting in a lot, quite a lot of work. There's no getting away from that. And um, and normally these these people have got quite a vested interest, and they normally form the core of a of a of a board, and they might even become directors of the company straight off. And if they've loaned you money, they've obviously got a vested interest in seeing the company succeed. So so. Actually, our boards and steering committees formed from the get go of people who were really interested in getting in getting the whole thing going, basically. So growers, um, members who wanted fresh veg, um, uh, mainly. So, so um, yeah, we 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 started out with that model right from the very beginning, really. And 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 as as Ed said, the advantage for us with, with that system was that the growers could concentrate on growing and thinking about the growing and other people could think about the policies and the strategies and things like that. I mean, you know, they, they had, um, they put in that time as well. So, um, yeah, that, I'm just saying it, that's how it happened from our point of view, but, uh, uh, I don't know, Ed, if you've... Uh, yeah, I'll just... Uh, yeah, exactly the same. Um, if you're, if you're um, establishing or incorporating as a CIC, um, you need a board of directors. Yeah. Um, you need more than two people who aren't related. Yeah. Um, so you need a minimum of three. Uh, <clears throat> and that's just in terms of getting incorporated. Um, we at Chagfu, we went through... We started with four directors. Um, and that was the case for the first three, four years. And then as we took on more employees, we kind of expanded the directorship. And at one point, I think we had eight directors. Um, my personal experience was actually, it was much easier to deal with a, a smaller board of maybe three or four rather than eight differing opinions. Um, so that's something you might want to bear in mind early on. Yeah. Um, it's much easier to, um, to deal with a yeah i mean it's hard it's very hard once you've taken on new directors to <clears throat> ask them not to be directors basically <laughs> <laughs> so i'll start small and build up as you need rather than start big and contracting that would be my advice yeah no I, 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 yeah no that's that's fine um it is one o'clock so um i think kind of this is the allotted time i don't know if there's any last minute thoughts from anyone before we all sign off um hopefully we'll all be meeting soon uh, one way or another um, anybody got any? I'll just chip in and say if there are specific questions um, on anything that I've covered, certainly, and I'm sure the same for Gareth, then yeah. as always, please feel free to ping through an email or our yeah. numbers are on the website. So give us a call. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah again, we're only too happy to try and help yeah. you get going with your CSA adventure. That's what we're here yeah. for. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So thanks to you all and hopefully see you soon. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks Cheers. so much. Bye, it was really Bye. great. Yeah. Thank you. No okay. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.